Aloha kako and talofa. My name is Yaneta Le'i from Wailua, Hawaii, and I'm part of the Sundance Institute Indigenous Program. For over 40 years, Utah has been home to the Sundance Film Festival, and I'd like to acknowledge the Ute Tribal Nation, the ancestral keepers of the land that Sundance calls home. I would also like to honor the indigenous lands and people from which you join us, from our cold weather cousins in South Me lands to the Kanaka Maoli banded together atop Mauna Kea, Hawaii. Wherever you are in the world, enjoy our reimagined 2021 Sundance Film Festival. Good evening. Welcome to Conjuring the Collective, a celebration of women artists in this year's virtual Sundance Film Festival. I'm Pat Mitchell, board chair of the Sundance Institute and a member of the Women's Leadership Council, who originated and supported the idea of a Women at Sundance celebration, which has become over the years a much valued time and space set aside to honor and celebrate the women artists in our community. And this year, we celebrate that collective at the first ever Sundance Speakeasy. Now, that's a term that conjures up many images. For me, it's a dimly lit space with music, of course, and dancing, and an atmosphere that invites sharing secrets, opening up our hearts to the creative spirits and feeling the magic of connections and community. That's the speakeasy environment that we invite you into tonight to learn some secrets from barrier-breaking women whose creative choices shaped paths forward for other women artists. Also appearing at the Sundance Speakeasy, poets, musicians, dancers, actors, writers, directors, women storytellers, all shifting the narrative about women, about culture, and community. An important shift begins with numbers. And this year, 53% of all projects in the festival were directed by women, and that is something to celebrate. While we recognize we have a long way to go to true equity as artists and media makers, especially that's true for women of color. Women come together around common purpose or in community. We dream some of the same dreams. We meet some of the same demons. We're often inspired by the same spirits. And at our best, we share a desire to lift each other up, to use our power collectively. Our community is here tonight for you and for women everywhere. So choose your brew and enjoy the show. Moreno, and I am the subject of, docu of a documentary called Just a Girl Who Decided to Go For It, and it was submitted to Sundance, and it made it. I am so thrilled. Out of 15,000 submissions, I'm told, I have to show off. I became one of the 10. So you're seeing, you're, you're looking at a very happy Puerto Rican woman. A book was written about me and it was published by Harper Collins. And I didn't even know a word of it till the publisher said it's coming out and we hope you like it. It's about your life. So this is my book called A Girl Named Rosita, which is my true name, by the way, Rosita Dolores Alberio. Anyway, this is the part of the book where it says Rita Moreno is ready for Hollywood. But is Hollywood ready for Rita Moreno? And then it shows pictures of me being uh, an Indian maiden, uh, American Indian. I played tons of those. Uh, or a girl from Egypt, 
or Tupton from The King and I. And those are the pictures. And then the book says, someday she just wants to quit. But then again, she's come too far to give up. One day, one day, she will play an authentic character who is bold, proud, strong. And then on the following page was my favorite two pages is Rosita dancing in West Side Story, the movie that she made in 1959. The newspapers announced that Hollywood is making West Side Story and the first Broadway musical in to hit the movies. This film, this part of Anita is everything that Rita has been waiting for, boy, you bet. Uh, she auditions for Anita, that means I tried out for Anita, a proud Puerto Rican female lead the big, big, big part. And for a month, Rosita practices, step, turn, snap, kick, swish, jump, twirl. And that is my favorite page with all these wonderful little figures of me dancing and loving every moment of it. I come from an era when someone like myself didn't even have a role model. I made a role model for myself of um, Elizabeth Taylor because she was a teenager like myself. And, uh, and if she could become a star, well, maybe I could. Uh, that was really very unrealistic, but I had no one. There, I didn't have a mentor. I had no one. And uh, it's heartbreaking. I mean, look at all the gorgeous, wonderful women writers now there are in the black community. Oh my God. What do I envision in the future for women in the arts? Well, I'll tell you something. I think it uh, started with uh, the me movement and it's already happening. It's a question now of expanding and, uh, and it's happening. It's pretty thrilling. I am thrilled that it began to happen with the me movement because I'm still here to appreciate it and to celebrate and to celebrate women. I think women are women's really best friends because it didn't happen for me with women in the, in the past is because of the times. I mean, who was in charge then that was a female? Almost nobody. But I see nothing but greatness coming. I'm glad that I'm alive. I'm sorry that it's come so damn late in, in a way to affect me, but maybe not. Maybe Ava will call or somebody will call and say, hey, how about doing blah, blah? And I will drop everything and say, you bet. And she may say, well, it's a small part. I say, I don't care. There are no small parts, Ava. <laughs> My name is Apioko Sarah Mashong Abe. I go up by Apioko on stage. I'm a Ghanaian poet, author of The Matriarchs First, a media practitioner, and an activist. The poem I'll be sharing with you tonight, I titled Bewitched Vaginas. I wrote it specifically for this Sundance Festival event because when we think about the word vagina, a lot of the time we think of it as a dirty word. But what better way to describe and celebrate women than with our vaginas, which are unique to us? So I hope that this is a call to action for women all over the world, regardless of your race, uh, regardless of how you identify any sphere of life, to come together so that we can work together for power. Enjoy. Ago. 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 I am the royal town cry. I am the queen of my poetic woman queendom. I am the goddess of poetic African savannas, jungles, rivers, and oceans. I am the lioness, the tigress, and the Ghanaian mermaid. I am the matriarch of modern poetic nations. I am 
poetry incarnate. And my pen fears no sword, no man, no woman, no coward, no beast, no plague. Forget the muse, for I am the muse. For at my conception, long before my birth, I was bewitched by a vagina. My curse is to carry my own vagina as a curse and a blessing in itself. And no creature or force can match the power of this lady hole of mine. So tonight, tonight, I bring the magic of my womanhood to this gathering, this convention, this coven of magical beings who have also been bewitched by vaginas and who understand that women are often branded as witches because our woman power is perceived to be so powerful that there's no way that it cannot be the power of witchcraft. Ago! Amen! I am the royal town crier. I am the queen of my poetic woman queendom. I am the goddess of poetic African savannas, jungles, rivers, and oceans. I am the lioness, the tigress, and the Ghanaian mermaid. I am the matriarch of modern poetic nations. I am poetry incarnate. And my pen fears no sword, no man, no woman, no coward, no beast, no plague. I said, forget the muse, for I am the muse. Listen to me. We have been bewitched by vaginas. The differences in the color of our skin, in the potency of our accents and mother tongues, in the fullness of our bellies, our hips, and our backsides, in the curl patterns, the kinks, the length, and the color of our hair, in the fullness of our breasts, in our sexual preferences, in the lengths of our periods, in the stories of the births of the children that have come out of our wombs, these differences must unite us beneath tonight's moonbeams and not divide us in tomorrow's sun rays. We must conjure our unshakable feminine energy to create an unquenchable fire of female synergy, bring our blood, skin, and sweat together, welding our hearts and tongues and minds to each other, creating potent vaginal woman potions that are heavy with the heritage, the toil, the strength, the majesty, and the magic of the centuries of the covens that existed before ours. And these covens are relying on us to use our bewitched vaginas to reclaim the woman glory of old and set the pace for her future. Hi. I'm Marley Matlin. I'm a Caucasian woman wearing an orange and gray top with a gray sweater and a pendant that represents I love you in sign language. Hi, my name is Sean Hader. I am also a Caucasian woman with blonde hair wearing a jean jacket. And I am the writer director of CODA, which is premiering in the US dramatic competition of the Sundance Film Festival. And Marley is um, one of my lead actors. Uh, I play uh, in the film Coda, the character Jackie Rossi, it's a beautiful film. I play the mother of two children, one who is deaf and one who is hearing, and my husband is deaf in this film. So the story of CODA is about, uh, well, CODA stands for Child of Deaf Adults. And uh, the story centers around Ruby Rossi, who is a hearing girl in a deaf family. 
and the family work as fishermen in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And Ruby um, has a love of music and finds herself torn between um, pursuing her dreams and feeling responsible to her family and her fears about um, abandoning the family's fishing business. For me as an actor and as a person who is deaf, it was so, um, it was so, well, fun or being on a set where I knew ASL was everywhere. It was my culture. I didn't have to worry about miscommunication with hearing crew. Not that there's anything wrong with having a hearing crew. I've worked in with hearing crews all my entire career, but there were so many deaf people. There was, you know, interpreters, Sean used ASL as a director. Uh, the crew picked up sign language, uh, American sign language and it, it, it was a, it was an entire collaborative effort, and uh, it, I I actually looked forward to going to work every day because I knew there would be the opportunity to just speak to everybody, not just my interpreter, which is typically the case, and it has been in my career, and that was new for me, and I I hope for more experiences like that. I think there's been a real radical shift in the industry that I have personally felt, you know, where I've watched my female director friends get more work. I'm watching them directing episodic. I'm sort of, there's been a sea change, I think, happening in the industry. And Marley and I were talking about, you know, whenever you start having these inclusion conversations, you have to make sure that there's intersectionality and you have to make sure that those conversations about women include deaf women and women with disabilities and creators with disabilities. And how do we, sort of open up that conversation because I think in all of the conversations that we're having about diversity, disability has really stayed a little bit on the outside of that. And I think the more voices that are heard and the more people who, um, the more representation that we have on screen, I think, you know, the more our humanity as storytellers is expanded. In order to, uh, I mean, to make a film work, you you always have to be aware that you do your homework as a director, you reach out to organizations, you do whatever it is. And having to incorporate uh, the deaf community is no different. You you consult, you collaborate, you you do what you do with, in any film. So it's not any any different. So I wanted to to add to what Sean had to say that I have to say my first film, by the way, was directed by a woman. Children of a Lesser God was directed by Randa Haynes. And I have always wanted to work with more directors who happen to be women. So I'm so thankful that I had a chance to do that again with Sean. Um, she is an actress director. She understands the experience of working with other women. She doesn't find herself in a position where she's dictating, but rather she's open-minded, she's collaborative, she's fearless. There's nothing uh, on the set that, that, that she's concerned about. And I really have to be thankful for the opportunity to work with Sean. You're a great, great director, Sean. Thank you. I think there's also a lot of fear within the industry or with, you know, what I have heard is how would that work? You know, if I, if I write this role, you know, if this is played by a deaf actor, how does that work on set? And I think the thing that um, we need to embrace is like, yes, it might work differently. And yes, there are different elements that you need to have. Um, but those elements, when you put them in place, you can create, it's, it's not just a challenge, it's an opportunity and it's an opportunity to work differently. And I found that this set functioned better than other sets that I've been on. Um, and because there was a connectivity between different apartment, departments because everyone was focused on communication. And so I think, you know, whatever fear exists in sort of stepping into the unknown, I think that can be easily overcome when you have the resources and you, you know, the more that we do this, the more there is just a, a way of working. Well, I hope that for the audience, when they have an opportunity to see CODA, 
uh, understands and approaches a film with an open mind, listen to everything. And by listen, I mean, look at it with an open eye, uh, watch everything that you find there on the screen. It's all I can say, you'll find the film an enjoyable experience. Jamison, and I'm the former artistic director of the Avenale American Dance Theater. I am delighted that Ailey is participating in the Sundance Festival. I'm totally delighted uh, that I was asked to this conjuring of women. I love it. I love the title. You know, when I'm thinking about uh, being called Mr. Ailey's Muse, it's kind of difficult for me because when you're in it, you don't think of yourself as being anything other than a, being privileged to be able to work with Alvin Ailey. But in Cry, dedicated to all Black women, especially his mother, touched another heartstring. Thank God I didn't know that that's what the ballet was dedicated to. It's physically draining and you have to pull everything out of you that you ever had in your life, your life experience to do it. So he did this with so many of us. So considering myself amused later on in life, okay, I'll take it. Thank you, Mr. Ailey. You only got one body, you can't lie in it. You gotta tell the truth in it, if you're a dancer. You know, cause audiences will know. The women just pile up, not just dancers, but just women in your, in your life, your teachers, as I say. Uh, a nurse or, or, you know, whatever. They, they're people in your life that you have to, you don't, you might not see them immediately, but they're there and they're your spiritual guides. There were tons of women behind me <laughs> whose shoulders I was standing on and they were telling me to get off of their shoulders and just stand on your own two feet. Powerful forces always in women. Don't we have a VP who's a woman? Thank you. Black woman? <laughs> See what I mean? But in the meantime, as a woman, you plow through. You just, women have been plowing through forever, haven't they? I mean, just, you make a way. You make a way. And you get to where you need to get to. In the time I was growing up, I was a black woman. <laughs> I wasn't just woman, which is not a just anything, but I was a black woman. Do you know the hurdles that I had to go through? I didn't think about the hurdles. I just went, you know, because there were people behind me who did the same thing and they didn't waste their time. <laughs> what way have I noticed that women artists, creative people are better together than apart. Sometimes I notice that. Not all times do I notice that. But even when this, what I find interesting about women is that even if we're out here someplace going different ways, we always do this <laughs> because we have to. We have to. This is the world, way the world is, you know, it just is. So, uh, Instead of the illusion that we'd all be like this, you know, we can come together when we need to, to get something accomplished, you know, to always get something positive accomplished or to shed light 
on whatever needs to have light shed on it. It's just from our strength, that's all. It's just simple strength. How are you? Thanks for coming to the Speakeasy. My name is Rika Aoki, and I am inviting you for the next three minutes or so in my beautiful rent-controlled COVID home away from home. In my work, I like to talk about small things and how small things really aren't so small. In my next novel, I talk about immortality and stars, but that means nothing if you don't have donuts. And tonight, as I think of sisterhood, I think of my sister, who I came out to last year in a phone call. It was just between us, but it changed my world. After I told her, after we ended the call, I looked at this room and somehow it seemed lighter, more possible. Somehow the world seemed more possible. My coffee seemed like something I could finally share. I could share my day. For she said she loved me no matter what. For she said that she had always wanted a sister too. Tonight I would cook rice, poach chicken thighs and Japanese dashi with shiitake mushrooms, some diced green onions, ground pepper, little fresh ginger. On my table would be the electric bill, but I'd get to that. A DMV notice saying my car still needed smog check, but I'd get to that. And I would still be middle-aged, still alone, still transgender, still worried about my safety, worried if every relationship I had escaped had actually been my last chance at love. But I had a sister. Sisterhood, so difficult for me to mention. We talk of sisterhood, of chosen family, of sisters of color, of trans sisters, but so often sister translates to afterthought, to survivor, to mourner. How every morning one wakes up and learns that another sister is missing, that another sister might be dead. And yet my grandmother showed me how to pickle eggplant and one day when my sister asks, I'll show her. Or maybe we'll just order pizza because sisterhood. Because now, as I think of sisterhood, because now I can imagine all my different sisters in my queer, trans, greater sisterhood, I can imagine that one day we might share a cheaper DoorDash alternative, chat about that awful stuff you have to drink before a colonoscopy, about the vice president on the cover of Vogue, about whether to save for a hybrid car, about the pros and cons of pumpkin spice latte at Starbucks, about, 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 about nothing, about love. Love that, e that exists even when one doesn't have to struggle, even when one doesn't have to try. Thank you. Take good care of yourselves, guys. Hi, I'm Amy Redford, and I am in awe of all these remarkable women. The other night I was perusing this impressive lineup in search of what to say, and my daughter clocked my struggle, and looking over my shoulder, she said, Mom, are you speaking for all women, or just women at Sundance? I said, Honey, I just learned to speak for myself. I could never speak for all women. We are not all the same. And that got me thinking. The importance of supporting a spectrum of female experiences has never been more important. These artists, these stories, remind us to dislodge from the familiar and see through an unfamiliar lens. There we find community and the dignity of difference. These stories are the bridges. I'm so humbled and inspired by all of you who have deposited your craft in the cultural landscape. I'm grateful on behalf of all of the youth who lean towards a female identifying experience. Over four decades ago, my dad and the founder of the Sundance Institute understood the ROI of women getting the requisite toolbox to tell their stories. This vision was given wings by many of you in this room. Thanks to Carrie and Pat and all of you in the Sundance community for helping us hold space tonight. And thanks to the artists 
for letting us bear witness.